Jaya Shirade, everyone. We will continue to read the Saints of Raj. This is the chapter story number 12. Sri Lala Babu. It was evening. The sun was about to set. Lala Babu was out in a palanquin for a pleasure drive in Calcutta. In front of the palanquin were some gunmen some dogs, some dogs, some dogs, and a number of servants. Yeah. The palanquin was brought down and kept in the midst of a beautiful grove surrounded by trees and creepers laden with fruits and flowers of different hues. A hookah, hookah is a, a, a smoking pipe which is used to smoke tobacco. It's like the Nargile of the uh -huh. Arabian countries, uh -huh. Uh -huh. similar kind of things. A hookah with a long pipe having a silver mouthpiece was soon placed before Lala Babu. <coughs> Resting on one side on a large pillow with a velvet cover, he held the pipe close to his mouth and started smoking. As he was smoking, a cool evening breeze was blowing. The birds returning to their nests were twittering. The waves of Ganga seemed to be dancing to their tune, and the crimson rays of the setting sun added their own charm to the scene. Lalababu's heart was swinging with joy to see what appeared to him to be nature's entertainment for him. He felt that there was no one in the world happier than him. Suddenly, a spark disturbed him. The spark came from a cottage nearby. It was the cottage of a fisherman, and the fisherman was asleep. His daughter was trying to awaken him by saying, Baba, awake! The day is about to close. The sun is setting. And the problem to read slow is that you interrupt the feeling of the sentence of the reading, like it becomes just a kind yeah. of, uh, that is the problem, you know? No, no, just say so that's why I know, but <laughs> not easier, like, uh, to, to cut my word. You know? <laughs> the words of the girl kept ringing into Lalababa's ears for some time he felt that he had heard a call from Vrindavan a call from Radharani who was saying Baba how long will you continue to sleep life's term will soon be over. So wake up and do what you can while there is yet time to conquer death. The call came like an electric shock. It shook the entire frame of Lalababu's body. The pipe 
fell from his mouth. The Hubble bubble of the hookah stopped. There was a sudden change in him. He was no more the Lalababu who considered himself to be the happiest man of the world. The dream world of happiness in which he had so far lived had no attraction for him now. He had realized that death was more real than power and pelf, than the majesty and grandeur he had been enjoying. He knew that when that came, everything would melt into nothingness, like every puff of smoke he had emitted while smoking and watched curling and curling until it melted into the sky. The call had awakened him from his slumber. He had decided not to sleep anymore. He had determined to renounce everything and to go to Vrindavan to devote the rest of his life to the service of Radha Krishna. With this determination, he went home. He passed the whole night weeping and praying to Radharani so that she might give him the courage to act immediately in response to her call. The next morning, he called his wife and children and said, I have heard Radharani's call and I am going to Vrindavan. His wife and children started weeping and wailing. Other relatives and friends used all their wit and strength to move him from his determination. But he ignored their persuasion and the weeping and wailing of his wife and children and started for Vrindavan. <clears throat> Lalababu's real name was Krishna Chandra Sinha. He was born in 1775 with a silver spoon in his mouth. His grandfather, Ganga Govinda Sinha, was the governor of Bengal and Bihar when Warren Hastings was the governor general of India, English. He had by his extraordinary ability made a huge fortune and had become the owner of a large estate. His brother Radha Govinda was also fabulously rich. Krishna Chandra Sina's father, Prana Krishna, was the only heir to the property of the two brothers. He, therefore, became the richest and the most respectable man of Eastern India of his time. Krishna Chandra was his only son. Ganga Govinda Sina used to call him Lala, out of affection. The servants in the family and the other people called him Lala Babu out of respect. Therefore, he became known as Lala Babu all over India. 
Lalababu's intelligence was extraordinary. His father appointed the best teachers to teach him English, Sanskrit, and Persian. Within a short time, he acquired mastery over these languages. He loved to read Bhagavatam. His study of Bhagavatam was so thorough that he could explain the deeper meaning of any of its slokas within sur with surprising acumen and skill. Is the 12th story so many such things? Mm -hmm. other page mm -hmm. He was also very kind hearted and generous. His heart melted to see the suffering of the poor and the needy. Once a poor man who could not marry his daughter for want of money approached him for help. Immediately he asked the treasurer to give him a thousand rupees. The treasurer sought the permission of Lala Babu's father. He said, since Lala has already promised this, some, uh, this sum to the man, you give it to him. But tell Lala that he should give money in charity in this manner only when he himself earns something or increases the earning of the estate. Lalababu felt this very much. He said to himself, the grandson of a multimillionaire, Ganga Govindasina, does not have the authority to do even a small service to anyone. Very well. Then he will stand on his own legs before he does any such thing. Much against the wishes of his parents, he went to Vardaman and accepted the post of Saristedar, head of a department in Vardaman Collectorate. On account of his extraordinary ability, he began to rise rapidly from one position to another. At this time, he also got married and had a son. In 1803, Orissa also came under British rule. He was then appointed governor of Orissa. He got an opportunity to live in Puri, the place associ associated with the divine Lila of Mahaprabhu, Sri Krishna Chaitanya. This gave a Philip to his innate tendency towards bhakti. After his official work, he began to devote the rest of his time to the study of religious book, Nam Japa and Kirtan. After some time, he got the news of the death of his father. The news filled his heart with great pain and remorse. Because after he had come out of home, he never went back and his father died without fulfilling his cherished desire for seeing his son and grandson. He relinquished the post of governor and went back to Calcutta because the burden of managing the estate of his father had now fallen upon him. He began to look after the affairs of the estate, but he often asked himself the question, does this estate together with all the wealth of which I am now the master, serve the real purpose of life? If not, 
Why should I not seek the path of bhakti, which promises not only eternal peace and happiness, but also the eternal company and the loving service of the twin lords of my heart, Radha and Krishna? Radha and Krishna seem to attract him to Vrindavan, but the thought of his duty towards his widowed mother, wife, and children, and perhaps a desire that still lurked somewhere in his mind, the desire of enjoying at least for the time being the opulence at his command pulled him in the opposite direction. The conflict continued in his mind until he heard the call of Radharani. With the call came the final decision, which took him to Vrindavan. In Vrindavan, he lived the life of a recluse. From morning until evening, he spent the day in Bhajan. In the evening, he went out for Madhukari and contented himself with eating whatever he got. His heart wept to see the condition of some of the old temples and their deities who were not being properly served. He wished that he could do something to improve their condition, but he could only wish because he was now a pauper and a beggar. However, a thought came to his mind. He said to himself, I am a beggar, but not my Lord. My Lord is the owner of the big fortune I have left in Calcutta. Out of that, I can give to my wife and children their legitimate share and spend the rest in the service of the Lord while I continue to live only on what I get in alms. He started working on this plan. He got 25 lakhs of rupees from his Jamidari estate in Bengal and Bihar. With this money, he started purchasing extensive land and property in Vraj. Altogether, he purchased 74 paragana of land, which is extensive land comprising of many villages. He used the income from the land in repairing old temples and constructing new temples and rest houses and making arrangements for proper service of the deities in the temples. He also planned to build a beautiful temple of Radha Krishna in Vrindavan with arrangements for providing food to hundreds of sadhus and the poor every day. The construction of the temple was started. Lalababu had often to go to Rajasthan to purchase high-class stone for the temple. On the way, while going and coming, he had to stop at Bharatpur for a day or two to stay with the Maharaj of Bharatpur, who was his old friend. On account of his intimacy with the Maharaj, he once got into great trouble. At that time, East India Company was having negotiations for a treaty with the Rajas of Rajasthan. The Maharaj of Bharatpur's role was important in the treaty. The Maharaj, for some reason, refused to sign the treaty. Some people told Sir Charles Metcalf the East India Company's resident in Delhi, 
that the Maharaj was willing to sign the treaty, but he changed his mind on account of the advice of Lala Babu. Metcalf, therefore, got Lala Babu arrested and brought to Delhi for legal proceedings. The news of Lala Babu's arrest spread like wildfire in the whole of Raj. Thousands of Rajavashis rushed to Delhi to protest against his arrest. Metcalf was surprised and also somewhat worried to see that Lala Babu wielded so much influence in Braj. He postponed the proceedings against him and sent his spies to Braj to make necessary investigations and report about his past history and character. Their report opened the eyes of Metcalf. He set Lalababu free and apologized to him. He also offered to give him the title of Maharaja, which he declined with thanks. <laughs> In due course, Lalababu's grand and beautiful temple was built in Vrindavan in the area known as Brahmakunda. Beautiful deities of Sri Krishna and Radha were installed. Pran Pratista ceremony was also performed. The deities of Sri Krishna was named Sri Krishna Chandrama. Arrangements were made in the guest house for feeding hundreds of people with prashad every day. But Lala Babu continued to beg food for himself as before from the Brajavasis. One day in the coldest month of January, as Lala Babu was looking at the handsome figure of Sri Krishna Chandrama, a strange thought came to his mind. He asked the Pujari to keep a small lamp of butter on the head of the deity. The Pujari looked at Lala Babu with surprise. Lala Babu said, Yes, yes, do as I say. I want to see whether the deity is really alive after Pran Pratista. Pran Pratista is the ritual of deity installation. If alive, the butter should melt on account of the heat of the head. The pujari had to obey. A small quantity of butter was kept on the head of Sri Krishna Chandrama. After some time, the butter actually melted and began to flow down the cheeks of the deity. The Pujari and the other devotees present in the temple on the occasion cried aloud with tears of joy in their eyes. Shri Krishna Chandramaki Jai! Shri Krishna Chandramaki Jai! Lalababu was so overwhelmed with bhav that he fell unconscious on the ground. Once again, Lalababu wanted to test the deity. He thought that if there was heat on the head of the deity, there must also be breath in his nose. Why not test that also? He gave a piece of cotton to the pujari and asked him to hold it close to the nose of the deity. Laughingly, the pujari held the cotton close to the deity's nose. The cotton began to vibrate on account of exhalation. Lalababu was again overwhelmed with bhav. Not being able to contain the bhav, he began to roll on the ground. He was satisfied that Pranpratista 
was successfully done. No one should, however, think that Brown Pratista alone is sufficient to infuse life into the deity. What is of greater importance is the, uh, is the path of the devotee. The deity lives and moves and appears or disappears according to the path of the devotee. It was Lala Babu's path that enabled the deity to pass the two tests successfully. The deity always responds to the heart of the devotee. One day, Krishna Chandrama told Lala Babu in a dream, I am pleased with your service, but I beg of you one more thing. Beg, Prabhu, you have only to order this humble servant. Kindly let me know, what more can I do for you? You do not know, Lala Babu, that I am a beggar by birth. I go about asking for alms from my devotees. Though there is nothing that I do not possess, and there is no place where I do not live, I prefer to eat what my devotees give and to live in the temples they build for me. You have made a temple for me in which I live with pleasure. <clears throat> but I want that you should build one more temple. One more temple? You know, Prabhu, that I'm a pauper. All the money I got from Jamidari, from the estate, has already been spent. How can I build another temple? I know that you have renounced everything, and there is not a shell left that you can call your own. But the kind of temple I want you to build is built only when a man has renounced everything. When a man renounces everything, he builds a temple in his heart. I love to live in that temple more than even in Vaikuntha. You have made so many temples outside. Make one within, so that I may live there eternally. I'm standing at your door today and asking for this bhiksha, alms. Then Prabhu, kindly let me know what I should do to make my heart a temple for you. You first go round Raja. See all the different places associated with my Leela. Then do bhajan in Govardhan. As you advance in bhajan, you will yourself come to know what you have to do to make your heart a proper dwelling place for me. Lalababu went out on pilgrimage in Braj Mandal. He saw all the holy places associated with Krishna Lila and then began to live in a cave in Govardhan and do bhajan. Every morning he went on Parikram or Giriraj. After Parikram, he did bhajan in the cave throughout the day. Late in the evening, he went out for Madhukari. One day, while he was out on Parikrama, the pujari of the temple of Giriraj said, Baba, do not go for Madhukari today. I shall myself go to your cave this evening and give you the prashad of Giriraj. In the evening, it started raining and continued to rain until night. 
the rain was so torrential that it was impossible for the Pujari to go out. There was no end to his anxiety for Lala Babu, who, he thought, must be very hungry. Because he took Prashar only once after the days Parikrama and Bhajan. When the rain slowed down, he thought of going to Lala Babu with Prashad. He had already kept a thala, thali plate filled with Prashad for him inside the temple. When he went inside the temple, he was surprised to find that the thali was missing. There was no time to think how the thali could have disappeared. Quickly, he arranged for another tally of Prashad and proceeded towards the cave. As soon as he reached there, Lala Babu said, What is this, Pujari? What more have you brought? I have not been able to eat all that you brought before. See, it is still lying there. The Pujari was surprised to see the missing Thali and Prashad in Lala Babu's cave. Who brought it? He shouted at once. Lala Babu looked amazed, uh, amazedly at the Pujari and said, What? Do you mean to say that you did not bring it? I neither brought it nor sent it to anyone. No, no, you brought it. I reprimanded you for coming all the way in rain and getting badly drenched. But you only smiled and went away. I wonder how you have forgotten everything so soon. Have you taken bank? <laughs> The Pujari knew that he had not taken bhang. He kept looking at Lala Babu for some time with tears flowing profusely from his eyes and then suddenly stretching his hand to touch his feet, he said, Baba, you are fortunate. You have so won over Giriraj by your love that he could not see you hungry and himself came to you in my form in the rain with Prashad. On hearing this, Lalababu's entire body was filled with Asta Sattvika Bhavas, and he fell unconscious on the ground. On regaining consciousness, he began to say with tears flowing from his eyes and throat choked with emotion, Prabhu, you took so much trouble for this undeserving servant of yours who could not even recognize you. How can anyone recognize you if you do not want to be recognized? But if you can be so kind to an undeserving servant, why come in disguise? Is that not to intensify his suffering in separation? For many years, Lala Babu had mentally accepted Siddha Krishnadas Babaji of Govardhan as his guru. One day, he requested him for Diksha initiation. He replied, the time for your diksha has not yet come. Some subtle samskaras, which is the effects of past actions on the mind, of your previous worldly life are still vitiating your bhajan. You must burn them in the fire of varagya, ascetic detachment from the world. When that is done, I shall myself come and give you diksha. You do not have to come to me. 
Lala Babu continued his bhajan with renewed vigor. Although not yet initiated, he lived like a Babaji. He wore Kopin and Kanta and lived on Madhukari like the Babajis of Braj. Quite some time passed like this. Still Diksha seemed to be far off. Lala Babu often used to go to Vrindavan to see whether the service and the distribution of prashad in the temple of Sri Krishna Chandrama was going on satisfactorily. This time, when he went there, he wept before the deity and said, Prabhu, I know that I have not yet been able to build the temple you asked me to build in my heart. My guru told me that I still have some samskara which make my heart impure. But unless I know what those samskaras are, how can I try to remove them? I am blind. Unless you help me, I will never know them. I will always remain impure and the temple you want shall never be built. That night, Lalababu could not sleep and passed the whole night weeping and praying. He had never wept so much before. The tears washed away his impurity. When he got up in the morning, his vision was clear. He could clearly see the samskaras that had been vitiating his bhajan. He said to himself, I have renounced the world and all its pomps and vanities, but have I renounced the vanity of vanities, which means the vanity of renunciation? Does not the subtle pride of renunciation still lurk in my mind? Do I not in my heart of heart regard myself as superior to the people who have not renounced? Is my mind completely free from hatred or malice? No, it is not. At least there is one person to whom I still bear malice and that is Set Lakshmi Chanda. If I did not bear malice to him, I should have gone to him for Madhukari, just as I have gone to other people living close to him. But I have always avoided him. Is that not a clear proof that I still bear malice against him? Set Lakshmi Chanda was the builder of the famous temple of Rangaji in Vrindavan. He was a rival of Lala Babu and his competitor in all such activities as the construction of temples, almsgiving, and the service of sadhus. Lala Babu had also filed a suit against him in connection with a dispute regarding the ownership of some land in Vrindavan, which he had won. But the old malice against him was still lurking in his mind. As soon as he became aware of it, he decided to amend it. One day, there was a big crowd of beggars in front of Rangaji's temple. In the crowd, there also stood a handsome-looking beggar with the beggar's bag hanging from his shoulder. He was beating cartels and singing Harinam and tears were flowing from his eyes. 
He was easily recognized by the guard at the door. At once, the guard went in and told Satiji, Lala Babu is standing at your door for Bhiksha. Satiji was stunned. But in a few moments, he collected himself an order for a tali with 100 gold mohors, flour, rice, pulses, and fruits. He himself went out with a tali, respectfully bowed down before Lala Babu and said, Babuji, I am extremely grateful to you for kindly coming and sanctifying this place by your holy presence. Kindly favor me by accepting this tali. Lalababu said, Sadji, I came to you for bhiksha, but what you're giving doesn't look like bhiksha. You are correct, retorted the set. What I'm giving is not bhiksha. You are Raja, though outwardly a beggar. I am not capable of giving bhiksha to a Raja, to a king. I had the full hardiness to enter into a conflict with you in which I was defeated. This is my second defeat. In the first defeat, you had captured what I suppose was my land. In this defeat, you have captured my heart. You are now the Raja, the sovereign of my heart. What I'm giving you, therefore, is not Piksha, but Nazarana, present given to a Raja or landlord, in recognition of your serenity over my heart. No, no, said G. A pauper, a beggar, is always a beggar. He does not deserve this present. Kindly, give me only a handful of rice from the tali. I ask for one more bhiksha. If knowingly or unknowingly I have ever committed any offense against you, kindly excuse me and bless me so that my heart is purified and I become worthy of the mercy of Krishna. Lalabab was in tears when he said this. Sadji also began to shed tears. Both were overwhelmed with emotion. Both clasped each other and drowned each other in each other's tears. When Lalababus was returning to his temple, on the way he saw Mahatma Krishnadas coming towards him with a meaningful smile on his face. Soon after Lalababus had done Dandavat, he patted him on his back and said, My son, the time for your diksha has come. On hearing this, there was no end to Lala Babu's happiness. On an auspicious day, he was initiated. After initiation, the Guru said, Now you go back to your cave and practice sadhana. Do not come out of the cave and do not see the face of any man until you have the darshan of Krishna. Lalababu began to do sadhana strictly according to the advice of his guru. After some years, he was blessed with the darshan of Sri Krishna. His heart was also turned into a temple for Sri Krishna 
when Krishna Leela of Sri Krishna and Krishna Leela always unfolded itself to him on the screen of his heart. Soon after, Lala Babu became famous as a Siddha Mahatma and people from different places began to come to him for darshan and advice. Once Maharaj Shindya came to him, he laid himself prostrate at his feet and prayed for Diksha. Lala Babu said, Maharaj, Diksha alone will not do. Krishna wants that you should stretch both of your hands towards him. If you hold the world with one hand and try to touch Krishna's feet with the other, you will never be able to touch him. Are you prepared to stretch both hands towards Krishna? Maharaj was not prepared to stretch both hands. He said, Maharaj, what you say is correct. This path is not meant for worldly persons like me. He performed Dandavat at the feet of Lala Babu and left. Slowly, Lala Babu's live stream became leaner and leaner. One day, he asked the people who surrounded him to take him to the bank of Yamuna. There he left his body, chanting the name of Krishna and seeing Krishna Lila. Sri Lala Babu Ki Jai. Is ten present, huh? Lala Babu. Yeah. Neighbor. Sorry? Neighbor. Yeah, neighbor. Near uh, Brinda Kunja. Uh, yeah. Very bare monument. But. Please, <laughs> Randaji. Hmm? Show your feelings. <laughs> Something. <Yeah. laughs> We missed the first part. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Second was the <laughs> okay, next thing. Hmm? Yeah. Would you like to share anything on this? Because I missed the first part. Yeah. So this is a, but this is very much inspiring. This kind of this sadhu was so pure. Even a little bit, some kind of sanskara. Or say, if, if tinge of karma, a tinge of impression in the heart, we cannot get to the, the darshan of Krishna. Or even this time, we cannot take diksha if we are tinge of some kind of material thing. This is. Kapoor uh, is writing maps. All minds, negative feelings mm -hmm. towards someone or something. So we we have some little bit, of some kind of bad feeling to 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 some devotees. Mm -hmm. That is kind of a, is a obstacle mm -hmm. to to get to Krishna prema or kind of. Dear go deeper and deeper and deeper. That Guru Dev say we we should not uh, uh, kind of swim on the ocean. We should dive into the in the ocean. This this Radhavab story is amazing. And this guru, guru also, you know, self realized. Guru could understand, oh, now you are ready. Now you can have addiction. Yeah. 
And this is also very interesting. Huh? Are you prepared to stretch both hands toward Krishna? <laughs> And uh, he said, I'm not prepared to stretch both hands. Because we are thinking like this. We live nicely in this material world. Nice family. Nice work. And this happy in this material world. Also, same time we want to be happy in the spiritual. So it means we both hand we are in this material world and spiritual. Of course, for us we are very, very uh, foreign. It is uh, not bad. But here, yeah, Nara Babaji was very high. Both hands should be both Krishna. That means, even though we live in this material world, our consciousness for the Radha more. And only for the pleasure of Radha <laughs> This Radha Mahu story is the same. But uh, we have tendency. Oh, this is for myself. Oh, this is for Krishna. Oh, this is for Radha. Oh, this is, this is mine. That is, we have some tendency to. But uh, this Radha Mahu story is uh, no, you should give up everything for Krishna or Lala. So this this sadhu is very high standard. That I feel. But anyone like to Share any feeling, something? Would that be? Rade, voice is coming? Yes. No sign. Are you not? No one say. Anyway,、うん、this for us is fine. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Let me see more stay. So, you say this is very high, high class. Of the goal. Then,、uh, so does that mean we shouldn't like try to go to this level? Or what is there anything that we can learn from this story? What to do in everyday life?、Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. あ、私が質問させていただきます。今、高い段階の、もう、質問です。とか、で、で、本当に私たちは、もう、ハードできる、ご感じてはなんていうか。うん。この話を私たちの毎日の修練の中で何か学べることができるんじゃないのかを聞
Uh, whatever position is, someone who is a good hustler, someone is you know family man or a single man or uh, any person, lady man, every activity I try to do the pleasure of Radha. That consciousness should be yeah. But we have a tendency. Oh, this is, this is my pleasure. And this is Radha Mohan pleasure. But this, this stage of sadhu is everything 100% surrender. Whatever they do is for the pleasure of Radha. So our consciousness also should be like this. So if we want to be Radha Dasi, so 100% offer to the Radha. Radha's pleasure, Radha's Mohan's pleasure. That's uh, I think this is a good day of teaching, same. So everything, so like surrender is give our ego to good day. <laughs> and if we give up for the sake of, then we could do everything for the pleasure of another. But if we have a tinge of ego, then we cannot do 100% for another. So this bhakti sadhana is to try to uh, say, you know, at first we are, you know, I surrender 50% to that. Or then 70%. And then slowly, slowly, 100%. And then Gurudeva is saying the word, if we have in Swarupa, if we are in kind of Swarupa, and in a kind of spiritual uh, identity, spiritual body, in that consciousness, then we can have 100%. But sometimes our consciousness, sometimes our, you know, like a bodily consciousness, sometimes mental consciousness, sometimes spiritual consciousness. So, and this, this level of person is always in, in spiritual consciousness. That's I, I feel. <clears throat> okay, next. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <clears throat> so we continue with the story number thirteen. Sri Sanehiram Ji. Everybody in village Math in Braj remembers Sane Hiramji with reverence and sings his songs of divine love with joy and devotion. Born in Math in 1842, he was devotionally inclined from his childhood. His elder brother was a farmer. He often sent him to the field to work. But he went there and sat down to meditate. This annoyed the elder brother, who thought that he was hypocritical and lazy and wanted to avoid work 
by pretending to be a devotee. Once the elder brother took Sanehiram with him to the field for sowing. He, start, he started plowing the field and asked Sanehiram to sow the seeds. Sowing went on until it was time for lunch. Sanehiram saw his sister-in-law coming to the field with a lunch box over her head. He was afraid that his elder brother would start eating without offering the food to the Lord, and he would also have to take the unoffered food. So he began to meditate. In meditation, he speedily arranged bread, curry, and vegetables in a plate, scattered tulsi leaves over it, and began to offer it to Radha and Krishna with mantras. While he was doing this, the work of sowing stood still. When the elder brother saw this, he dealt a strong blow on his hand with a stick and said, Have you come here to work or to aid the great saint with your eyes closed like a hypocrite? Sanehiram said, Brother, what have you done? I was offering food to the Lord and you struck me. Everything got scattered. You imposter, shouted the elder brother and was going to strike him again when his wife cried, Oh, what is this? And began to stare wide eyed at the things contained in the lunchbox all scattered in the furrows of the field. His attention was drawn in that direction, and he too was amazed to see the edibles lying scattered on the field. He realized that his brother was not an imposter, but truly a saint. His heart was ablaze with penitential fire, he clasped the feet of his brother and begged his pardon. From that day, he freed him from all work at home and in the field. Sani Hiramji was a great devotee of Biharuji. Since Biharuji's temple is in Vrindavan and Mat is on the other side of Yamuna, one has to cross the river for going from Mat to Vrindavan. Still, Sanehiram went to Vrindavan every evening to have the darshan of Biharuji. Neither rain nor storm would thwart him. He took his evening meal only after having the darshan of Biharuji. One day, he remained seated in meditation until late at night. When meditation was over, it was 2 a.m., but he thought that night had just set in. He started out for Darshan of Biharuji. On reaching the bank of Yamuna, he saw in moonlight that all the boats were moored at the bank and no boatman was there. He was filled with anxiety. He thought that perhaps he had committed some offense on account of which Biharuji did not want to give him darshan that day. But soon he saw a boatman coming from the other side. As he came closer, he recognized him. He was the same boatman who took him across the river and brought him back every day. With a sick of relief, he stepped into his boat. When he reached the temple, he found it open as usual. He had the darshan of Biharuji to his heart's content and went back to the bank. 
the boatman who was waiting for him ferried him across the river. Disembarking from the boat, Sane Hiram was startled to see a number of villagers coming to bathe in the Yamuna. He asked the boatman, is it morning? So it is, sir. It was already two o'clock when I took you to Vrindavan. How is it that you were here so late at night? Oh, sir, don't ask about that. Yesterday, I had a quarrel with my wife. So I did not go home. I lay down on the boat, but could not sleep. But how is it that the darshan of Biharuji was available even so late at night? Sane Hiram began to reflect. Was it all a dream? The next day, when he went for darshan at the usual time, the boatman who took him across every day was by the landing. <coughs> he asked, Sir, did you not go for darshan yesterday? Of course I went. Have you forgotten? Said Sane Hiram, as he looked at him like one who was dazed. When did you go? I did not see you. Someone else must have taken you across, because I went home somewhat early yesterday. Sane Hiram then realized that it was Biharuji himself who had carried him across in the, in the guise of the boatman. The realization brought tears in his eyes. As the sattvika bhavs, like trembling and sweating, also began to appear on his body. He wondered and wondered why Biharuji should have taken all the trouble for him. But there was nothing to be wondered at in this. For Biharuji always yearns for an opportunity to serve his devotees in whatever way possible. He has no other work to do. He says, I perform different kinds of activity only to please my devotee. Sane Hiram Kik This is the beauty of Bhakti Yoga. <coughs> because devotee always wants to try to please the Lord, Ishta Deva. The Ishta Deva wants to please the devotee. This is a kind of competition. Like uh, Radharani tried to please Krishna. But uh, sometimes Krishna won't to please. This is uh, today. So today we went to we went to Parishan, eh? mm. and then we went to Mamandi, eh? and then one one Pujari told us. Eh? So Radhara become ma. Speak something. Okay. So Radhara become ma. And then, so Krishna asked some Saki, what to do? Radharani does not allow me to do you know, anything. Even whatever he does, Radharani said, you know, Radharani man does not pacify. Maybe you can come as a, like peacock. And dance. 
and then Krishna become like a peacock. Then Krishna uh, dance. Then Radha Rani, and then another peacock also. You know, Krishna become peacock, and also another peacock also dancing very beautifully. Radha Rani is so pleased to, to see the peacock dance. And then Radha Rani want to give uh, some food, kind of reward. And then Radha Rani give to the, some food to each of peacock like this. And then, then Radha Rani, Radha Rani touching one peacock. And then she was like feeling like, you know, so much ecstasy. And then she could not understand who is this guy? Who is this peacock? Then radicals, ma is broken. This one, this one uh, kind of pujari told us this kind of story. So Radhika want to please Krishna. Also Krishna want to always please Radhika. This is Braja mood. Especially some, some place like, uh, you know, Seba Kunja or sometimes Nikunja. So, yeah. therefore, devotee does not lose anything. Sometimes we think, you know, we offer everything to Radha Moha. Then we lose everything. But actually, it is not true. Because Radha Mohan give more beautiful thing to, to give to us. So, but uh, we, we think, we, we think we, I lose everything. But actually, not true. It seems we may lose, but we get everything, whatever we, we need by the mercy of Radha Mohanj. And this next, next chapter was a very beautiful story. I don't know, we can have time. Next, huh? This, yeah. This, uh, this is uh, almost the first Western devotee. This, this is Gopesh, uh, you know, this is uh, one devotee is Bec like Western devotee, I think British devotee, yeah, person. It's not this one. No, or maybe different. Different, right? yeah. Or maybe different. Maybe. different yeah. Sorry. There is one mother being shared. Pishma. Yeah, Pishma. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.